Okay. Hello, 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 everyone. This is Dr. Garrett Smith back for another Love Your Liver live stream. Um, I'm also known at, around YouTube here as the Nutrition Detective, so we are going to go into one of the mysteries today of why they say vitamin A is necessary for things like the retinoic acid, or sorry, retinoid X receptor, the RXR. A lot of people say that this receptor is specific and it needs retinoic acid to do its job. That's what they say. Now, for those of you who are familiar with my work, uh, my website's nutritiondetective.com and the Love Your Liver program can be found at members.nutritiondetective.com. If you're familiar with Grant Jenneru's work at ggenaru.blog, somebody else can post that link, please, because I don't want to type out Grant's name and use that. And there's Anthony Mawson's work. We've been showing that mm, over time, humans don't need vitamin A. Now, the people, other people out there, who are not as versed in the research as I am. Let me post this link. I'm going to post the link that we're going to be going through. I'm posting links from this, but this link is from my old, um, I called it the research forum, but it was really just a forum where I was the only participant and I was posting like I was a blogger. For some reason, I was... For some reason, I felt more comfortable posting in a forum format than I did in a blog. So I did. Had to get it out there. Um, so what I did in this article, you'll see as I go over how many different things are known to activate or stimulate the retinoid X receptor. And once you see, especially the last one, the last one is amazing you'll see that it doesn't make any sense molecularly or receptor wise that we need vitamin A specifically to do anything. So we're going to go through that. I do see a couple of super chats. Thank you folks for doing those already. Super chats do get to the top of the question line folks. So if you, if you have a question you really want to get answered, do a super chat and I'll get to it. Otherwise the place where I answer questions right after this is the inner circle inside the nutrition detective network. And we meet every, right after the live stream, every week where I take unlimited questions in the time I have. And that's for, that's for the people who are really wanting to hear my unfiltered answers, because some of you may not know this, but some of my older videos, even from four years ago now recently have been uh, removed, even though they were unlisted. So my information is becoming a bit unwelcome if you will. Anyway, don't forget to like the video. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. If you're here later, leave a comment. If you're here now, X out of the chat, go like it. This is what helps the algorithms to know to send other people here. So please do that. I'm not going to tell you what's in the water. That's one of my current experiments. So let's get into it. So I have an article here on my old research forum called there is nothing nothing essential or vital about vitamin a part two the molecular evidence so first we're going to discuss some terms okay so you need to know what an agonist is an agonist is a substance something a compound which initiates a physiological response when combined with a receptor so think of it as like a key in a lock and it opens the door okay Agonists do it. Receptor. A receptor is a molecule in a cell membrane which responds specifically to a particular neurotransmitter, hormone, antigen, or other substance. So the receptor is the lock. So the agonist goes into the receptor, right? Agonist, receptor, turns the lock, opens, causes whatever to happen, okay? Ligand. A molecule as an antibody, hormone, or drug that binds to a receptor. So a ligand is something that binds to a receptor. It can be what's called agonistic, which means it kind of stimulates it or makes things happen, or antagonistic, which means it works against, slows things down, stops things, okay? 
So first, where was this link from? Um, I think it's from, well, I have a, a picture on here showing RXR agonists. So let me just go over. So RXR agonists, these are things that are activating or stimulating the retinoid X receptor. Now, remember they named this receptor retinoid, that's vitamin A, X receptor. They named it. And so they're trying to fool you into making you think that you need retinoids to make this receptor work. Well, let me just go through in this, in this visual that I have in here, this, this picture that I took from a, uh, I believe it was, well, it was, a, it was definitely a, um, it was an RXR study, but they show here things that can agonize or stimulate the retinoid X receptor. We have nine cis retinoic acid. That's what's called allitretinoin. That is a chemotherapy form of vitamin A. It is made in your body from all, from some of the vitamin A you eat. Okay. Docosahexanoic acid. That is DHA. That is what most people think of as in fish oil. So one of the compounds, one of the PUFAs in fish oil can stimulate the retinoid X receptor. Phytanic acid is another one. And lithocholic acid is another one. Lithocholic Litho means stone forming. Lithocholic acid is one of the most toxic secondary bile acids in your body. So a toxic, a secondary toxic bile acid can stimulate the retinoid X receptor. Let me just read through some more of these. They have some synthetic ones they've made. 9CUAB30, AGN194204, CD3254, LGD1069, which is bexerotine or targretin. That's a synthetic retinoid. So they can make retinoids in the lab that will do this. They have LG100268, LG101305, something called methoprene acid, PA024, SR11217, SSR11237, BMS649. So... We've already got like, oh, how many things is that? 14 things that can stimulate the retinoid X receptor and multiple of them are not retinoids, okay? Arachidonic acid is another thing that can bind to the retinoid X receptor and agonize it or be an agonist for it, okay? Are there other things that stimulate the retinoid X receptor? Well, we have a paper here called Retinoid X Receptor RXR Alpha Gene Expression. How much it does stuff is regulated by fatty acids and dexamethasone. That's corticosteroid in hepatic cells, in the liver cells. Okay. I'm, I'm geeking out a bit today. Folks, but I want you to show this to people who are like, well, why do we have a retinoid X receptor then and a retinoic acid receptor? And why do we have these things? They shouldn't be, they shouldn't, we have to have it to activate that. I'm showing you that's complete BS. Okay. So yes, it's a bit of a geeking out. And yes, you're going to have, yeah, you got to wait for the questions because I'm going to geek out today because I want to show these people that it's not what they tell you and they have lied to you. So here we go. Here's from the abstract. This work describes the molecular mechanism of fatty acid and hormonal modulation of retinoid X receptor in rat liver. Hmm. Fatty acids and hormones, you say. We examine the effects of different fatty acids, myristic, stearic, linoleic, oleic, arachidonic, and tetradesylthioacetic acid and the synthetic glucocorticoid dexamethasone on RXR alpha mRNA and protein steady state levels in hepatoma cells, those are liver tumors, and cultured hepatocytes, those are liver cells. Fatty acid induced the RXR alpha gene expression. Let me repeat that. Fatty acids, not vitamin A, fatty acids induced the RXR alpha gene expression. Hmm. But fatty acids aren't retinoids. Weird. Continuing further down, the RXR alpha protein level in cultured hepatocytes, liver cells, showed a similar pattern of regulation. 
our results indicate that the RxR alpha gene expression is under distinct regulation by fatty acids and dexamethasone acid, which strongly suggests a coupling with the lipid metabolizing system and the retinoid signaling pathway. So as I wrote in here, I said the question after that becomes which fatty acids actually don't stimulate the retinoid X receptor. Why is that important? Well, Here's another one for the retinoic acid receptors, so the RAR ligands library. So remember, a ligand is something that binds to it. Ligand binds to a receptor. And they're trying to tell you that you need retinoids, retinoic acid, retinol, retinaldehyde to activate these things. So if we look at the so I saw somebody say my sound's out, and I was like, oh, man. No, okay, I, I'm pretty sure it's good. The RAR ligands library has 7,500 compounds in it. The retinoic acid receptor ligands library, things that can bind to the retinoid X, or sorry, retinoic acid receptor, the RAR, there's 7,500 compounds in it. Did I put that link up? Yes. 7,500 compounds in it. I hope you understand that you don't need vitamin A to activate any of these supposed receptors. 7,500 things. And then we're going to get even better. What if we could show that the, vit the RxR didn't need any ligands at all to activate it. Wouldn't that be weird? Well, Emma, I'm, if I'm breaking up, I can't, I can't stop it. So that's just my, uh, my Wi-Fi, I guess, today. So in the book, okay, so it's, I'm going to put the, the name of the book here because it looks like I can't put up the full link. Here we go. It's on Google Books. It is, it is the vitamin A chapter from Vitamins and Hormones as a, as a textbook, volume 75. I want to read this slowly so everyone can understand. In addition, here's the quote. In addition, fluorescence studies. Oh, oh, did you know they use luciferase for fluorescence studies? Luciferase. They use the luciferase enzyme to study vitamin A and vitamin D. Just a weird coincidence that I'm trying to get people to avoid the things that they use luciferase to study, isn't it? So continuing. In addition, fluorescence studies have shown in living cells that the formation of RxR heterodimers, this is where the receptors are actually joining, this is what they think is so important, do not depend on the presence of an exogenous RxR, exogenous RxR agonist. They're saying you don't need anything to make the RxR work. So we've shown there's all sorts of fatty acids that can make it work. There's DHA, there's phytanic acid, there's arachidonic acid, other fatty acids can make it work. Other synthetic retinoids can make it work. Methyloprene acid can make it work. Um, it doesn't need anything to work. There's 7,500 compounds that can, that can activate the retinoic acid receptor. 7,500 in that library that they have. So put simply, I'm going to get to the questions now. Put simply based on that, Somebody cannot justify molecularly, receptor-wise, that we need vitamin A at all. So, that's what we got. As in, there is no molecular or receptor evidence that you need vitamin A to do anything specific in the body. 
And the only symptoms they really attribute to vitamin A deficiency supposedly are night blindness and dry eye. Everything else you read on the internet about people saying vitamin A deficiency causes this, they only put point to two supposed deficiency states. And we can fix those typically with less vitamin A in the diet and more zinc. So let's get into the questions now. Okay, Ryan, thank you for the super chats, folks. Again, Ryan, thank you. Here we go. White flesh, sweet potatoes slash Japanese yams. Okay. The simple answer on this is no. They are still very, very high. Like, here, let me go find it. Um, let me see if I can find this quickly. Well, here's just somebody from lifehack.org who thinks they're doing something good for themselves. They say, where was it? White sweet potatoes, high vitamin A content. Not all white foods are okay. This is why when people, you know, people can go out and do whatever they want. Maybe they'll do okay. Maybe they won't. Um, I think if I recall correctly... There was something like, this is what I believe I recall. In a certain amount, I, I don't remember the amount, but I did, I did make them equal. In a certain amount of white, or sweet potatoes, normal orange sweet potatoes, there was something like 33,000 units or whatever the unit was, I don't remember, of beta carotene and other between the retinols, which they don't have any in sweet potatoes and the carotenoids that can, the pro vitamin A carotenoids, it was something like 33,000. Okay. That's gigantic. That's why you watch all these like paleo folks and CrossFitters slowly waste away after a while. Cause they're eating high fat diets with tons of sweet potatoes and spinach and all that stuff. Next white sweet potatoes were, came in around 3000, which is still far too high for somebody trying to do vitamin A detox. I don't know how they snuck them all in there because it is fairly white, but I would not, if you are trying to do a good vitamin A detox plan, I would not include them. Nope. So Mina asks, is activated charcoal safe to ingest? Yes. There was one thing out, what is it? Superfood, something. Uh, Mina, if, if you, and thank you for the super chat. If you find that website, um, the one where it's like a superfoods website and they write all these articles and they're totally controlled, totally controlled, um, where they love to speak poorly about anything that is like supposedly good in the natural world. And they went out of their way to find this one paper where they said there might be something toxic in activated charcoal. If you have that link, Mina, please post it. Oh, superfoodly. There it is. There it is. I got it. I don't really want to promote this link too much. Anyway, superfoodly, they, they wrote an article about, oh, charcoal might soak up nutrients and charcoal might have this one compound in it that might be a problem and then i go okay this site seems pretty <laughs> disinfo to me and i would say to them because they don't do it i would say please present one case of this so i think they talk about they this this uh, molecule might be connected to cancer Maybe. So they talk about it and I say, okay, show me a case. Show me a case. One case, just one. There's no cases or they would be in the article. Why would poison control continue to use it? Why would poison control be using charcoal if it's poisonous and there's no case studies of anyone ever getting hurt from it? Now, the one thing I can tell you that I found the case studies on charcoal, because you can imagine I've looked into this. 
the only case studies I've ever found where charcoal caused any problem in people was when people took an ungodly amount of it and they got basically an impacted colon. That's why we talk about if you're constipated, don't take charcoal until you figure out that constipation. And what do I consider constipation? Pooping once a day or less. I consider that constipation. So if you are pooping once a day or less, you should not even begin with charcoal. And then we have the infamous principle of if you're going to be dumb, you better be tough. So if you decide to not listen to me, yeah, you better start slow on charcoal because if you're going to back yourself up, you're going to want it to unback up quickly. And the less you take, the less you'll constipate yourself. So they also like to talk about the one study on uh, apple juice. Confirmed side effects. Confirmed side effects. Decreased absorption of vitamins. <laughs> they don't have a human study. They, again, I've brought this up before. The Journal of Food Quality published a study last decade where they measured the effects of mixing activated carbon with apple juice. They mixed activated carbon activated charcoal with apple juice. The amount that was mixed in was quite low, a much lower concentration than what's used in the ER for overdoses. Okay. And they said it absorbed some vitamin C, B1, B3, B6, and B7. So I asked them now, if you don't know how charcoal works, charcoal is an adsorption effect where it's it's kind of like a charged it's it's the charge of it is what pulls toxins towards it and holds them in it's not grabbing anything it's like a charge okay electrostatic charge i believe and what it does what it can do the great thing about charcoal is it things that adsorb can pick and if they come across something more toxic like charcoal when it goes through your body it will grab on to the more toxic thing it will exchange out the less toxic thing it already grabbed. And then it will exchange it and grab onto the more toxic thing. This is how these things work. So if you put charcoal in a glass of apple juice, it's going to grab onto whatever's there. Now imagine if you then drank that glass of apple juice and it starts going through your body. Do you think that on its way through your body, all, all of our bodies are toxic in the Western world, of course. As it's going through your body, do you think it's going to come across something more toxic than some B vitamins and vitamin C? Of course it's going to. This is why when people go into the research, you will not find a single case of charcoal ever causing malnutrition ever at all. This is why when they talk about this compound that might cause cancer, you, what would charcoal do with a, with a cancer causing compound that was around it? It would soak it up and hold on to it. Durr. That's what it does. Then there's not a single case of malnutrition, even though I'll find the, uh, the article on it. Um, Let me find it. Okay. Charcoaltimes.com. Does charcoal adsorb nutrients or minerals? And they talk here. Where is it? There it is. So there was a there was a study that they did on people who had um, let me find it. Wait, this may not be the right. Where's the article? Oh, well, so, so here's one. Um, here's a, a quote from um, the book Activated Charcoal Antidote Remedy and Health Aid. They're quoting a, uh, a paper, charcoal added to the diet of sheep for six months. Charcoal added to the diet of sheep for six months did not cause a loss of nutrients as compared with sheep not receiving charcoal. 5% of the total diet was charcoal. 
That means one out of every 20 grams of food they were eating was charcoal. It did not affect the blood or urinary levels of calcium, copper, iron, magnesium, inorganic phosphorus, potassium, sodium, zinc, creatinine, uric acid, urea, nitrogen, alkaline phosphatase, total protein, or urine pH. Hmm. Six months. Here's another article that they posted. I really do like charcoal times and charcoalremedies.com. They sell coconut charcoal, which I would much rather people try hardwood charcoal first. I am a much bigger fan. Coconut charcoal is everywhere. Coconut is becoming so omnipresent in foods, folks, that people are developing allergies to it. Like it's, it's, people are having more reactions. If you eat a lot of coconut stuff and you're feeling like not so hot, I don't trust the coconut thing now because it's a fad just like the soy thing was. There's all these health benefits. We can use every piece of the coconut. Maybe we shouldn't. Maybe we shouldn't eat so much of it. But anyway, um, they're talking about here does charcoal. Did I, did I post this one? Yes. Okay. Let's see. Let me find it. Here's, here's a quote from them. We cannot say categorically, categorically that charcoal does not depreciate the level of nutritive of absorption in any way, but both clinical observation of patients in hospitals and numerous animal studies have demonstrated charcoal poses no threat to nutritional uptake. While science has yet to prove this conclusively, it seems more prudent to say that if there is any adsorption of nutrients, it is so negligible that it has been yet to shown is yet to be shown to compromise one's health. For instance, charcoal has been used for many years as a fecal deodorant, a poop deodorant for patients with ileostomies and colostomies. Like they have a colostomy bag that, you know, they're carrying around their poop in a bag with them, right? Their, their intestines just dump into a bag. They don't poop normally anymore. In spite of the fact that they may routinely take charcoal orally three times daily for years, it has never been demonstrated to nutritionally affect these individuals who are already at risk of nutritional deficiency. And this was from a, a journal called Patient Care, and they have, the, they have the quote there. Now, continuing. In one animal study, Dr. V. V. Frolkis, a famous Russian gerontologist, that's somebody who studies elderly, and his colleagues demonstrated that the lifespan in older laboratory rats increased up to 34% by feeding them charcoal in their diet. The paper was in Experimental Gerontology in 1984. The researchers concluded that the binding up of these toxins in the intestinal tract before they are absorbed or reabsorbed into the system may be one mechanism that allowed the rats to live longer and healthier. And then we had that other quote about the sheep. So. Superfoodly's article is trying to scare you away from charcoal. And, and I've also posted in the charcoal articles in the network about how monkeys in the jungle would find charcoal from burnt things and they would eat it. The charcoal is not dangerous. And I would challenge anyone to find any evidence of it other than somebody taking too much. So I want you to know what, what do I mean about taking too much like poison control centers, when poison control centers give somebody a massive amount of charcoal, they automatically give them a laxative, like a serious laxative, because that's the only danger of charcoal is getting too constipated and having it back up and getting, getting like toxic mega colon because the charcoal will, it dry, it, it kind of can, it soaks up a lot of water. Those of you who do charcoal, like I just, I just made my drink this morning. It's in the other room, um, soaking up. It's nice and gelling up it does soak up more water. That's part of how like dry charcoal doesn't really adsorb anything. It's got to be wet. So there's water and toxins going in. Mina, if you're asking about aspiration of charcoal, no, you're not supposed to breathe any powder into your lungs. Here's a, here's a tip. Don't breathe powders into your lungs. It's bad for you. Would it not be good? Is it bad to inhale charcoal into your lungs? Sure. Is it bad to inhale 
fire smoke into your lungs? Is it bad to inhale like full on ash into your lungs? Yeah, all these things are bad. Don't hold the teaspoon up to your nose and don't snort charcoal. There you go. Don't snort charcoal to detox your sinus. How about that? You could swallow all sorts of things. I mean, people could take soluble fiber capsules and it, that's why I don't use capsules with soluble fiber ever is because soluble fiber capsules, if they get, if you're terrible at taking capsules, they could get stuck in your throat. And if you don't, if you run out of water, if you run out of water and it's stuck there, your saliva will eventually start expanding it and it could theoretically choke you. That's why they make fiber in wafers so you chew it up. That's why they put it in powders so you mix it in water. Okay. And I would guess that aspirating soluble fiber, psyllium husk, what's sun fiber, snorting sun fiber is going to be bad for your lungs too. Breathing it in. Your lungs are designed for gases, not solids. So that's a pretty simple one. Am I worried about aspirating charcoal any more than anything else? No. So hope that helps. Okay. But is it safe to ingest? Yeah, I've never had, I mean, it's, it's, and here's the other weird thing. I'm going to tell you one other weird thing about charcoal. And as the charcoalremedies.com website has said, and the charcoal times, those are connected. Just so you know, those are the same people running both of those. Um, where was I going with that? Oh, they were saying that, oh, what? I lost my train of thought on that one thing. Um, <clears throat> dang it. Nah, going to have to let it come back. Not going to grab it on live online. So, okay. If it comes back to me, I'll say it, but, oh, oh, some people can, it can, they actually talk about this very weird thing. Okay. Most of the time charcoal doesn't cause a bile dump doesn't trigger it like soluble fiber and because it doesn't trigger a bile dump and, but it soaks up so much bile and we've talked about how you need bile to poop. I'm not going to go over that again today. You need enough bile touching your intestines to trigger pooping. So if the charcoal goes in there and it soaks up all your bile, you don't poop well. That's why it constipates. Okay. The weird thing is, is some people this, don't plan on yourself being this. And if you're going to try charcoal, always start everything slow, folks. Always start everything slow. Some people, it seems to trigger pooping better. They actually talk about this on their website, and I've seen it too. Some people poop better with charcoal. I have no idea who that is, and I have no idea why that is. It doesn't make sense in the typical reactions. But it happens. This is why we have the saying, Pierre, you may want to write this down, anything can cause anything. And this is why you should never, ever ignore if you take something and it makes you feel a certain way and that's not what the rest of the internet seems to have happened to them. Your experience is the only legit one. So if everybody else on the internet seems to be raving about something and you try it and you feel awful, stop. Again, that's the doc. Doc, it hurts when I do this. Well, don't do that. And I'm going to expand that one into doc. I've been doing this for a while and I've been slowly getting worse for a while. We'll look at the things that I, this is why we have the office hours coaching that I do for people who are working directly with me, because sometimes people don't put two and two together that they'd been increasing lactoferrin slowly over time and slowly getting symptom aggravations, increasing soluble fiber over time, slowly getting symptom aggravations doing things slowly over time that you're not getting along with can slowly aggravate the problems that the bile dumping and the leaking and that stuff too. This is not a game. And it, a lot of people have trouble paying attention to what is actually happening in their body or putting together that I've been doing this for this long and I kind of started increasing my soluble fiber for this long and oops, Maybe that was too much. Those of you who are getting nuts about the soluble fiber, just know that it's too much soluble fiber is like a rite of passage. Those of you, if you want to comment in the chat or in the comments after this, 
feel free to relate your story about maybe you ignored my advice of go up slowly. And if you don't feel good, back off because all of us have done, if we've been doing this for a while, you've done too much soluble fiber and learned a hard lesson and you had to back off. This I used to take, at one point I was taking 60 grams of soluble fiber a day. And I think there's some people out there who are doing more than that right now. I think about 30 grams of soluble fiber is a good limit for nearly everybody like 90% of people, 30 grams is sol soluble fiber, something you never need to go over. In my opinion, some people will. Okay. But a lot of people don't need that much. I'm not doing anywhere near that much anymore. I'm doing like 15 grams a day now. And very little of it's actually from food. It's mostly from psyllium and it's mostly from sun fiber. So I don't have to force my foods to be high soluble fiber foods. And this is what you get to figure out in the program. So let me see. You've got a couple more super chats. Thank you, folks. Let me find them. Oh, uh, Tommy getting made. Thank you for that. Thoughts on intermittent fasting or one meal a day. Oh, mad. Thank you. Okay. Well, I've talked about how fasting, I believe fasting relieves symptoms so quickly, right? So how could you have had, the next question was about headaches and stuff like that. How could somebody have, let's say chronic headaches and they stop eating for one, two, three days and their headaches disappear? What changed? Oh, it's the autophagy, da, 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 da. No, they just stopped dumping bile because they're not eating. Their headaches were caused by the bile in their blood. Ooh, wait, let me turn this a little bit. Their headaches were caused by the bile in their blood. That when they dumped bile, when they ate fat, when they ate soluble fiber, when they drank coffee, when they did their bitter herbs, when they dumped bile, the bile leaked into their blood. And they got their headaches because the bile in their blood went up to their head and caused their problems. And both vitamin A toxicity and copper toxicity are well, well, well known to give headaches. And those are both in the bile that's leaking into the blood. Okay. So eating less often or not eating, you know, doing a water fast or even a juice fast doesn't have fat in it. And there's not a juice fast doesn't have fiber, right? They removed all the fiber. So they're taking out the two big things in a diet that would trigger bile dumping. And these people say, I feel amazing. And the other thing about juices, at least with an all juice diet, you're not taking in any fat, which means you don't absorb the carotenoids from the plant foods, hardly at all. So you're kind of protecting yourself from the vitamin A in that. And they feel amazing. And then they go back to eating and the headaches come back. Why? Because they just started dumping bile again. Why do they tell you to eat light when you come off a fast? Eating light tends to mean not eating a lot of fat. Why would you not want to eat a lot of fat when you come right off three days of storing up bile that your body's desperate to dump because you dump all that bile at once and you're not going to feel good. You're going to feel terrible. And how many people have we all run into who say, when I fast, I feel amazing. I need to do another fast sometime because I just feel so amazing when I do it. And then I remember working in a supplement store and asking people, so did your symptoms come back after the fast? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, even, even in, as a, like a young 20 something, I was like, you didn't fix anything. It didn't fix a dang thing. So when we're talking about, well, first of all, one meal a day, I'm going to make a general statement about fasting. Fasting too much will in a very short time, destroy women for sure. I, I watch it all the time. Too much fasting for whatever's going on in women. I don't know if it's because, okay, so women tend to store more body fat. Women tend to have, women have more body fat than men. Ladies, that's why you're generally smoother, you know, muscle definition wise than men. You naturally carry more body fat. 
And let's say somebody's fasting and they're digging into their fat stores and women have more fat than men and they're just throwing all these toxins. I've been over a study where it showed that losing weight could dump toxins and does dump toxins into the bloodstream. So let's say these ladies are fasting, they're burning fat, they're dumping toxins into their bloodstream. They have more toxins because they have more body fat. And they, they get ruined. If you're a lady out there, you know, born with the parts of a lady, and you want to comment on what fasting did to you, go ahead. This is just something that I've observed. So all you guys out there who are like, I just can't get my wife to do the intermittent fasting or the one meal a day or fast with me for three days because she just says it doesn't make her feel good. She's right. I mean, and women, women are going to be genetic. You know, why do men want to provide for women? And why would women be afraid of purposely starving themselves? Because women biologically want to be ready for pregnancy. They purposely don't want to starve themselves. So they're ready to get pregnant and make the baby with what's stored in them. So what I'm just saying is that, ladies, if you're going to mess around with fasting, you better be careful. Okay? Now, intermittent fasting. I joke about intermittent fasting because the way most people do it is they just, it should just be called skipping breakfast. That's the way most people do intermittent fasting. It's just skipping breakfast. It's not intermittent. What is the word? Let's look up the definition of the word intermittent. And why doing the same thing every day is not intermittent. Um, so coming and going at intervals, not continuous. So that one, you could do that. But really, if you think about intermittent fasting and you were trying to mimic nature, you wouldn't always have lunch and dinner or a late lunch and supper or whatever the heck you want to call it. Most people skip breakfast. And another thing, funny thing, pattern that we see in intermittent fasters is they're almost always addicted to coffee or caffeine. They're almost always addicted to coffee. Absolutely. They run their whole first half of the day on coffee. And if you don't know this, totally common. I mean, 90% of America, I believe, consumes some sort of caffeine every day. And if you think they'd let 90% of America consume something that's good for them every day, I got, you know, I got a bridge to sell you. If you think that chocolate and coffee would be on multiple places on every street corner of every city because they're good for you, you need to take some, uh, some theory courses on why they're not trying to help you be healthy. Okay. So one meal a day, I think one meal a day for a lot of people. Well, uh, one meal a day for a lot of people is just not enough because you have to, to get the calories in, you have to shove in a lot of food. And it just becomes, I, I mean, I did intermittent fasting. I didn't like it. It was like food became a job because if I missed getting enough food, boy, then the next day's screwed up. And then my body's trying to get even more food during my window. Okay. I think, I think intermittent fasting, what intermittent fasting is for most people very simply is it's simply a reduction in calorie intake because they're not eating as often and they're not stuffing their face as much. They don't have as many opportunities to overeat. Let me put it to you this way. The more times you eat in a day, including snacks, the more likely it is you're going to overeat. This is just this is just how it works. Like most people don't undereat. Most people, most people. If you look at America, most people are not undereating. I just went on a a vacation retreat thing this weekend. And I was eating very, very clean food. And I, I, I was, I thought I was eating not enough of it. Like I was sitting there going, I'm going to lose weight. Like the weird thing was two things I noticed on this when I was, when I was stress, a de-stressing, like not doing stressful stuff and eating 
super clean food, including meat and sourdough and stuff like that. I didn't get as hungry as I usually did. And I did not lose. I did not lose. I thought I was going to lose weight. Like I was looking at how much food I was eating. And I'm like, there's, there's no way like, this is just not enough food for me. And I thought I was going to lose weight and I, I didn't, it was super strange. I mean, but the power of lack, removing stress and eating better food than I usually did. Like I was sitting there going, why am I not getting hungry? Like my buddy kept asking me, are you hungry? And I was like, I, I, I'm not sure. Cause like, I wasn't getting as hungry as I used to. I, I wasn't getting hungry and that was super strange. So anyway, intermittent, I, I just think intermittent fasting is a way to eat less often. Now, if you eat less often, you're going to have less bile episodes. Okay. Could that be good? Could that be bad? Well, you're going to store up more bile in between the dumps. So the dumps themselves are going to be bigger. Why does Karen Hurd, the bean queen, do like, what does she do? Two tablespoons of beans every hour or every half hour? Like it's totally unsustainable. I mean, she wants you to do that the rest of your freaking life, whatever it is. Eight, two tablespoons of beans every hour or every half hour. I don't remember. But what is the advantage in detox, especially of bile, of taking in a smaller amount of soluble fiber multiple times a day? At any one point, you're going to have less bile. And you're going to have the soluble fiber there. So just think of it as like, it's like when things get bigger, they tend to get more out of hand. So if you're going to go eat one meal a day with tons of fat in it and tons of soluble fiber in it and tons of everything in it, you're going to dump a ton of bile. Is that good? Is that bad? Well, if we start seeing you not feel good, then we know it's bad. And is there more likely a chance of overdoing it the longer you store up the bile? Yeah, that's why they're supposed to eat light after a fast. So if you're doing daily fasts, at least for part of the day, you could be causing yourself some issues. Could it be your bile production somehow? And is that why intermittent fasting people and OMAD people are always on so much coffee? Hmm. Coincidence, right? Basically, I, fasting, I mean, I, I do think there are advantages to fasting. I will, I will talk about that probably in the inner circle topic today. Um, but it's, it has nothing to, it, it's not bile related. I mean, it could be bile related, but it's not specifically bile related. And then I just, fasting works better for women than men. If you're going to fast on a regular basis, like full fast, like dry fast or, or just normal drinking water fast, if you're going to do that weekly, like there's some people fasting weekly, I would just do 24 hour fasts, which just means like you eat, you finish eating dinner one day and then, or wait, what was it? What was it? You eat breakfast one day and you don't eat again until breakfast the next day, or you eat dinner one day and you, then you eat again at dinner the next day. That's just like a 24 hour fast. That's like, if you're going to do regular fast, that's as long as I think you should do the whole like one day fast where like, let's say, Thursday night, you eat dinner, you stop eating, and then you don't eat again until Saturday morning. That's like 40 hours, something like that. Done too often, that becomes too much. It doesn't seem like people can catch up on their calories, and they start wasting in not a good way. And of course, there are exceptions to all of this. But during the detox, when people are actively in the detox, I think it's better to pulse things more through the day, whether that's food or soluble fiber. You know, you can do, you can do apple pectin capsules through the day. For me, one of my, you could, you could almost say sometimes I'm intermittent fasting because one of my meals is my charcoal soluble fiber drink where I'm not really drinking it for the calories. 
And I'm using it to satiate myself because my history, I have a tendency to overeat. I'm, I was just, I eat too much. Programmed it in myself as a very young kid. So it helps me to not do that. But that's my thing on intermittent fasting and OMAD. The, the less often you eat, the more likely you are to run into problems. Can it, can it be helpful? Yes. Should you go about it slowly and figure it out? Like the first time you want to fast, don't do three days. Do 24 hours. And, and build it up, but give it plenty of time between them. Okay? So I, I do think fasting can give the bile leaks some time to repair. Absolutely. But fasting too often will store up too much bile, and when it's dumped, it it's not going to be useful. It's going to be like a flood. And a flood does a lot more damage than just rains. If, if, you, if you have a place that rains every day, you don't really get flooding. It just rains every day, and things are just wet. But if it doesn't rain for six months, and then all of a sudden that six months of rain hits you all at once, you're going to have problems. Do you see the difference? So that's that. Okay, so Christine asks, how best to slow down detox when you get symptoms such as headaches? What food supplements slow down detox without adding toxins? What's optimal detox? That, the, that last question, what's optimal detox? That's absolutely contextual to each person, and we're never going to know that because no one's going to do any research on that. So what's optimal detox is way too nebulous to give any type of answer to. But... How do you slow down detox without putting in more toxins? That's a tough one. Um, the things that people can do that I've that I've in that I've been okay with. One is if you got stuff going on in your stomach, like nausea or reflux, GERD, vomiting. If you can get activated charcoal down there enough, and obviously if you're puking and stuff like that you you, you may want to go you know you may want to do a, a significant amount of charcoal you know what is that for a person i don't you know one two three four five pills maybe which is about a quarter of a teaspoon i mean sorry four pills is about a teaspoon of charcoal but if you know you're real real constipated you're going to have to deal with you might be constipated after that but you wanted the symptoms to go away so you got to remember, when you are detoxing too hard, you have too many poisons in your system because they're coming out of your liver too fast. Now, the gentleman I was with this weekend does a lot of my stuff. He is a client. And he says that when he gets his migraine, when his migraines are coming on, he'll have his charcoal drink. Imagine that. He'll have his charcoal and his fiber drink. And then he'll go... And he'll do just a normal enema. Sometimes he'll do coffee enemas, but he'll do a normal enema, maybe a coffee enema. Not everybody's willing to do that. Right? That's, that's a pretty intensive <laughs> therapy, if you will, for a lot of people. No, there's nothing wrong with it. But can it? what is that doing? It's taking bile right out of your system. You are basically forcing water up there to mix with the bile. Does it trigger a bile dump? I don't. I mean, a coffee enema does. Yes. I don't know about water. But you then basically are inducing a form of diarrhea. You know, it's just, it's watery stool. And it's having all the bile come out with it. Okay. Coffee enema. The bitterness of the coffee, which is an indicator of a toxin, triggers a bile dump. We all know about pooping in the morning after drinking a cup of coffee. People poop better in the morning if they have a cup of coffee. Is that necessarily a good thing long-term? We'd like it so they don't need the coffee to poop. That's what we want. The coffee is a crutch for their pooping. Not the worst one in the world. I really do want people to poop. But anyway, so coffee enema then causes a bile dump, and it induces watery stool, which is diarrhea. And he said it will clear up the developing headache fairly quickly. 
So he is getting the bile out of himself. He's either absorbing it with charcoal and soluble fiber, or he is not sucking it out the other end, but he's pushing it out the other end, facilitating its removal, if you will. So there's those things there. I talk about a detox bath in the program, magnesium chloride. I saw magnesium chloride, some sodium bicarb, maybe a little bit of ascorbic acid to, to counter the, some of the nasty stuff that's in tap water. Um, even better would be to get a really good filter on your bath. There's those things. But when we talk about not putting more toxins in, no, there's not a lot of ways. Like if you want to shut it down, oftentimes the things that we do to make over time to make you less toxic are there there to help you move detox forward so they would often aggravate things in the middle of it that's just the way it works so most of the things that people are going to do to slow down their detox are things that we don't normally do on the program because we're saying the program was moving things forward too fast how do we slow it down do you understand that the program's moving things forward too fast. So we have we want to slow it down now. The person has decided this sucks. I've pushed things too hard. I had too much stress and I dumped too much bile or what or I went and I ate crappy at my relatives for a week and now I feel terrible. Well that that can just be eating feeling terrible because you ate terrible for a week. But I'm going to make this very simple. The things that help an individual person slow down their detox the most are the are typically the things that you don't do on the program anymore but they used to give you relief they used to make you feel better which are usually toxic things sometimes people get like a detox cough and it's just annoying as heck. And I tell them, if you want to see if this is detox related, I say, have a couple sips of alcohol. I don't care what kind. Just have a couple sips of alcohol. If the cough shuts down for like the entire night, it's detox related. You just took in alcohol. You slowed down your detox. And you see a symptom go away. We know that alcohol is not good for coughing. So it must be slowing down detox. Toxins slow down detox. And this is why the supplement world is so confused because they'll be like, but this relieves these symptoms. And then you go, well, let's look at the 10-year study on them. And people have worse symptoms. 10 years, five, three years down the line, five years down the line, 10 years down the line. It's called the duration paradox. I've talked about this. So if you want to... You're either going to, if you want to slow down detox, you are either going to actively have to like almost, how do I put this? Mechanically either bind up the bile, which is not soluble. Soluble fiber can cause you to dump more bile. So soluble fiber is not, unless you know it helps your detox symptoms, soluble fiber is not the answer usually. Charcoal can be an answer. And obviously poison control will give things to help people poop when they take a lot of charcoal. Do I talk to some people about that? Yes. So can you, if you can take charcoal and you can use some of the love your liver constipation helpers, the love your liver approved constipation helpers. I've been over those on another video. Um, if you can use those to help you poop and you can take more charcoal with that because you're able to poop better and you need to remember you need more water with charcoal, then sure. Yeah, you can do that. But there's also enemas, whether they're regular or whether they're coffee enemas, those would facilitate removal of the toxic bile through your guts. Otherwise, you're looking at things to relieve the symptoms. You know, the, the detox bath is not necessarily take. You could do a charcoal bath. You could do a oatmeal bath, the colloidal oatmeal. Soluble fibers. I mean, they've, they've shown colloidal oatmeal with eczema. So if we know that colloidal oatmeal baths can help with eczema, what do you think it's sucking out of the skin? What does soluble fiber bind to? Vitamin A, bile. What's in the eczema skin? Bile, vitamin A. So you can use soluble fiber on the outside too. 
So yeah, either taking it out through the skin, which would be like, you know, charcoal poultices, charcoal and lotion. I'm not going to go over the recipe here on that today. You could go over charcoal baths, colloidal oatmeal baths, enemas. You can do, um, like we talked about, charcoal internally. Those are the, those are the non-toxic ways that you can slow it down. Otherwise, you're looking at supplements or foods that you know we generally regard as toxic now, but used to make you feel better. Like if you know that taking mega doses of vitamin C used to help get rid of your allergies. Allergies are a toxin reaction, particularly to vitamin A. Carotenoids, are like pollen is yellow. It's full of vitamin A. So if high dose ascorbic acid or sodium ascorbate used to relieve your symptoms, it was slowing down your detox. So you might be able to use it again if your detox symptoms get out of hand. If you knew that eating some certain food relieved certain symptoms for you and you start detoxing too hard and you have some of those symptoms, you, you can do that food. It's slowing down detox and it's putting poisons in. You have to decide if the juice is worth the squeeze. And I cannot always decide that. Usually by the time people are coming and telling me, Dr. Smith, I don't feel good. I say, what are you doing? And we start going, calm all this stuff down. You push too hard. And they're like, I thought I was doing that. I thought that was what you would say. And I'm like, that's what I'm here to say. So, um, Let's go into, so I think that's all the super chats. Yes. Thank you everybody for the super chats so far. Let me get back up to the top of the list. Sam asks, oh, so I, would you recommend to avoid intermittent fasting? So I kind of already answered that question. Um, it's up to the person. Generally, if you're underweight, probably not a good idea to fast. I'll, let me add that too. Underweight folks, fasting is probably not the answer for them because when they lose weight, it's real hard to put it back on. Okay, next one. Reliable Andrew says, Hi, Dr. Smith. Why is lactoferrin preferred to class? What color is colostrum often? Good colostrum. Especially when you freeze it. It's very yellow because colostrum is super high in vitamin A. So why do we use an isolated protein that has no vitamin A in it over using the full spectrum colostrum? So we can avoid adding poisons when we use the beneficial thing. I've shown studies where the, the what's his name? Rodal. Where the babies were born to a vitamin A toxic mother and they seem to come out all right but they actually got vitamin A toxicity from nursing and they died, some of them. And then when they took the little, the little baby mice off of, the, uh, off of the nursing of the vitamin A toxic mother, they stopped them nursing and they fed them like baby rat chow, baby mouse chow. They all got better. So yes, mothers, you can poison your children with your breast milk. Absolutely. Don't ever think otherwise. And I'm sorry. You have that responsibility. You have the responsibility to make yourself cleaner or else you will detox fat-soluble toxins into your newborn. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. It's just the way it is. That's why when people go, well, why is vitamin A in breast milk, Dr. Smith, if it's not supposed to be there? And I go, do you know all the other toxins that are in breast milk that aren't supposed to be there? Just because one's... There's natural toxins too, are there not? So that's why I that's why I like the lactoferrin. It's also easier to control the dose. If you want to do a milk-based lactoferrin, do camel's milk. Camel's milk is the highest amount of lactoferrin of any mammal's milk. It's low in vitamin A, and the lactoferrin is the closest to humans of the mammal milks out there. It's expensive. Do you know how much lactoferrin you're getting? No. But when you rem if you remember, camel's milk was a huge thing in the autism world and a huge healing thing, a, fa a fad for a while, just like colostrum was a fad. 
here's the weird thing. Why would colostrum and camel's milk be kind of fads and, and seem to help a lot of people, but then fade away? If they work so well, why do they fade away? Because maybe there's problems otherwise with it. Maybe there's problems with the full spectrum of the milk. Milk is why I got into health, folks. That was the first food I ever reacted to that I realized I was getting so snotty from it. And so I abandoned it. Like, I have no desire to consume milk anymore, ever. None. If I take my two lactoferrin every day. For those of you who don't know, we just, um, the lactoferrin we're talking about, we are talking about, it's at nutritiondetective.com. It is our biggest seller by far. Last week, I had to get up in the middle of the live stream because we got another batch delivered. Um, let me put it up here. It is amazing. Lactoferrin, those of you who know, scientists call lactoferrin the miracle molecule because it fixes so many things. Weird that it would fix bile ducts, but you must be very, very careful with it. There is a link on the bottle and in the, the Love Your Liver program about how to start slowly on it. Very slowly. Let me say that again. Very slowly. The guy I went up to, to visit this weekend, he did not listen to me on the lactoferrin and he took too much the first time. He just jumped in the deep end. And he said he felt so bad for three days that he hasn't tried it again since. And that was like a year and a half ago. It can dump a lot of bile. It can dump a lot of bile. And those of you out there who have done it, you know it. So we start slow. Now I'm to the point where I can take two pills a day. You start with two pills a day, you, you jump in that deep, you better be ready to get your ass kicked. The more toxic you are, the more toxic the stuff is that's coming out of you and it can leak into your system. So you better be careful. The more toxic you are doesn't mean the more detox you can take. It means the less you need to start with. Or else it will kick your ass. Everything else is kicking your ass already. Why would you think that just putting in these magic things is going to make you not get your ass kicked? There is no easy way out of this. It takes time. I'm working on talking with somebody because I, I do think that one of the areas we have been neglecting in this process is proper breathing. Because what can we get rid of through the breath? Aldehydes. Hmm. Does anybody here talk about aldehydes much? So if we could, let's say you have 20,000 breaths in a day or something like that. If every breath was bigger in terms of more comfortable, but it functioned better. If your breath functioned better all day, could we detox faster? Would that help your stress level? Stress causes bile dumping. Could we help nearly everything? with some proper breath work. I'm going to tell you which breath work it is, not today. I'm getting that all set up. But it will definitely be on the Love Your Liver program and I'll talk about it in the future because I did, I, I learned some of this breath work this weekend and I really think it's helpful. I think it can be very, very helpful. So that's, that's coming too. Okay. Sam asks, what are your thoughts on buckwheat? It's another grain. It, I, I've had some people do, I had a guy do really, really well. He was doing basically a variation of the cowboy diet. He was doing beef and buckwheat. Buckwheat works. It is fairly high in oxalates, I believe. So you got to watch out for the oxalates. That can be a problem when people go on kind of a, it's not a mono diet, but it's, it's similar. A mono diet means you just eat one thing, but a mono diet with, I'm, I'm saying a mono diet with two things. I don't know what the word would be for that. But a very limited diet, if it's got too much of something in it, that, that will accumulate, that will bite you in the butt. And oxalates can be one of those things. So buckwheat is fairly high in oxalates. And I don't know about copper. If any of you people out there know about buckwheat and copper and how relatively how high it is compared to other grains, that'd be a good thing to know. But I have had some people do very well on lots of buckwheat. So is it okay? Yeah. 
Um, let's see. Olivia says, is it safe to say that everyone is dealing with at least some degree of cholestasis? If you have health issues, yes. If you have perfect health, maybe you got away from it. But if you're in the Western world, you got it. Okay. Um, and some degree of copper and or vitamin A toxicity. That's been my experience. I, I mean, I could show you labs after labs after lab. The people who are coming to me, vitamin A and copper toxicity and often iron overload, they just go hand in hand. And we look at the research and vitamin A increases your iron absorption. And when the, the whole thing is, is so when people are getting these liver injuries, which could be from glyphosate, could be from vaccines, could be from pharmaceuticals, could be from supplements could be from just eating crazy wacky diets like super high fat diets and all that stuff so, you know they were they used to drink a two liter of soda a day and it was tons of high fructose corn syrup i mean it doesn't there's all sorts of ways that you could damage the liver so this is the part that people have to understand they want to be like what caused this problem liver injury what can cause liver injury oh my gosh it's really a question of what doesn't cause liver injury so when you injure the liver, which means cholestasis, liver injury means cholestasis, which means you are leaking toxic bile into the blood somehow. Watch episode 71 of this live stream if you want to get the basics of toxic bile theory. So when you start detoxing slower, you get rid of less of everything. Does that make sense? Right. The more in, if you're a runner, the more injuries you get, the slower you're going to run. That's, that's how it works. This should make sense. The more toxic people get, the slower their detox systems run. Like, where, where's this one? Um, let me find this one study pesticide. There it is. I still have my search for it. Not that one. Um, but you see here, aldehyde dehydrogenase variation affects... Al aldehyde dehydrogenase vari variation enhances effect of pesticides associated with Parkinson's. Funny thing, my, mom's, my mom really, really started getting her Parkinson's-like syndrome when she lived on a house on a golf course, like on the golf course for six years. And we used to actually see her symptoms get worse when they would spray the golf course. Golf courses, if you don't know, folks, are so, 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 so toxic. Herbicides, fungicides, insecticides. They should probably call it humanicides, like humanicides. They're just like biocides, just kill living things. So she lived there and we, we could actually see it get worse. So what they're saying in this paper... Um, conclusion of the paper, aldehyde dehydrogenase, which is a very, very important detox enzyme, possibly the most important one, aldehyde dehydrogenase inhibition, slowing it down, appears to be an important mechanism through which environmental toxin toxicants contribute to Parkinson's disease pathogenesis, how the disease is created especially in genetically vulnerable individuals, suggesting several potential intervention, interventions to reduce Parkinson's disease occurrence or to slow or reverse its progression. Inhibiting aldehyde dehydrogenase contributes to the other environmental toxicants causing Parkinson's disease. Okay. And let's look at the things that inhibited ALDH while we're here. This is from the same paper. All of the metal coordinating dithiocarbamates tested, example, Meneb and Ziram, two imidazoles, Benamil triflumazole, two dicarboxamides, Captan and Fulpet, and one organic organochlorine, as in dieldrin, inhibited ALDH activity, potentially via metabolic byproducts. 
they say, give examples here carbon disulfide weird sulfur showing up in inhibited detox and thiophosgene exposures to aldh inhibiting pesticides were associated with a two times to six times increase in parkinson's disease risk genetic variation in aldh2 exacerbated or worsened parkinson's disease risk in subjects exposed to aldh inhibiting pesticides so so people go into the genetics all the time right so they're saying here just if you were exposed to the ALDH inhibiting pesticides, you had a two to six times more risk of Parkinson's disease. And then they said, if you have the genetic, the sucky genetics in your ALDH, like, like 50% of Asians have a, a bad ALDH2 gene. Okay. So can other people, but it's just Asians have the highest percent. Okay. So when they had the genetic variation, they still had, they had even more problems with the ALDH inhibiting pesticides. What's the answer to both of those? People will be like, well, I have this genetics. I have this genetics. What do I do? And it's like, avoid the toxin. That's what you do. If you have the genetics, it just makes it worse, right? People who get the Asian flush, which is the ALDH inhibition or the Asian glow. It's that thing where typically we hear about it. Some people might call it alcohol allergy, but it's when Let's say you have an Asian person or you are an Asian person and you have a drink or maybe two and you start getting a very flushed face. You get very intoxicated, probably tend to have pretty bad hangovers. Their ALDH doesn't work. They turn the alcohol into acetaldehyde, which is what causes alcohol poisoning and hangovers and all that stuff. The negative health effects of alcohol are mainly from acetaldehyde. So they build it up in their system and they feel terrible after that. I knew uh, a friend, a Caucasian woman, the older sister of my friend growing up used to say she had alcohol allergy. So it happens to white people too. But what, what would be the important thing for all of those people who have the AL, especially for the ALDH2 genetics, but the pesticides still caused ALDH problems in everybody. Avoid the aldehydes. Avoid things that slow down ALDH2. It's the same for everybody, but if you have the genetic problem, you have to work harder. Here's another saying to add to the principles, Pierre. Nobody cares. Work harder. But I have a genetic MTHFR detox. And my detox doesn't work as well. Nobody cares. Work harder. Everybody else has their own problems. Methylation problems, if you don't know, are caused by toxicity and deficiencies. And then there's the genetic component, right? These genetics loads the gun, environment pulls the trigger. You could have the worst ALDH gene in the world. But if you don't eat and consume and take the things that cause ALDH, aldehyde problems that contribute to aldehydes in your body or contribute to ALDH slowing down, it won't matter because you... Genetics loads the gun, environment pulls the trigger. Your environment was good, okay? If you have methylation problems and you need methyl groups from methylcobalamin or 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate, you are toxic. It's okay. We're all toxic. And if you have MTHFR, you may toxicity may affect your methylation more. What is the root cause? Your methylation sucks because you're toxic or deficient. And then you add genetics on top of it if it's there. But what is the key thing? To avoid the toxins and the things that slow down your ALDH. It's the same for everybody. What about the people with the crappy genetics? It's the same solution. Nobody cares. Work harder. This is your problem to deal with. I'm sorry. That's just the way it is. I could sugarcoat it. Do I think more supplements is the answer? No. It, 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 taking more and more supplements, more and more B vitamins. If you are having to mega dose B vitamins, now I'm not saying not to do it, but if you are having to mega dose B vitamins to prevent certain symptoms, you are medicating a toxicity. That's what you're doing. It's okay. 
People think I'm anti B vitamins. I tell people if you feel good, feel better, if you actually feel a positive effect from a B vitamin, it's doing something. But when they talk about B vitamins are water soluble and they just go right through you if you don't need them, why would you need mega, mega doses for a nutritional deficiency? You shouldn't need mega, mega, mega doses like 20,000% of the RDA. You shouldn't need that unless it's an antidote to some toxicity. Folate's necessary for aldehyde dehydrogenase. B1 seems to bind to aldehydes itself, and B1 is necessary to produce NAD, which is running alcohol dehydrogenase and aldehyde dehydrogenase. They're antidotes. If you have enough of them and you don't have tons of aldehydes, you don't need megadoses, but can megadoses help in the short term? Yes, just like eating foods and other things that aren't on the program. Can they help short term to slow down the detox? Sure. Sure. You can use them that way. Just, I just want you to know what you're doing. And I'm not passing any judgment. If somebody was like, I just feel terrible. I'm just going to eat whatever I want for the rest of my life. I'd be like, okay, cool. I'll, I'll see you down the road. You don't have to do a dang thing I say. If you're here, you better want to be here. <laughs> so do I think pretty much everybody's toxic and to some extent? Yeah. I mean, if you're in the Western world, you're toxic. I mean, the water's got just the water. Like you go swim in a pool. You're going in that like a giant pool full of tap water with all sorts of other things in it. Why do people's hair turn green? From swimming in pools, it's not its not the chlorine. It's the copper sulfate in it. It's the That's why not all pools turn your hair green, folks. It's the copper sulfate. So you're swimming in, in like a copper bath. And then if you got copper in the water pipes and they put copper sulfate in the pool as an antifungal. So it's like it's so hard to avoid. So if for people who don't ever think, I mean, detox can be simplified to just eat this, don't eat those, don't take those. It's really that simple. People don't have to know all the ins and outs about detox other than maybe don't push the soluble fiber too hard or the agitators that can dump bile, heat, stress, exercise, sweating, that stuff. Those things can dump bile. Can So on that note, can people use saunas to help their detox? Yes. Could saunas cause somebody to dump a whole lot of bile? And what would that look like? They feel terrible after a sauna. It's as simple as that. Let's say they go, oh, wait, I did 20 minutes of sauna and I felt awful. What should I do, Dr. Smith? I'd be like, try five minutes. I'm like, but that doesn't feel like enough. I don't feel like I get anything out of it. I don't want you to feel bad out of it. That's the point. Do a dose that doesn't make you feel worse. Right? Then over time, as you get less toxic, you could do more. You will be able to do more because your bile is less toxic and you're probably not leaking as much. But at the start, like Dr. Smith, when I, like fibromyalgia people or whatever, anybody who goes out and they exercise and they're wrecked. They try to go do a, a cardio class or whatever. And they're just absolutely destroyed. Well, don't do so much next time. Maybe knock that down by 90% and see if that's okay. And then go up to the next step. And then go up to the next step. Okay. Um, let me see if I missed anything. Nope. Okay. Oh, event said, hi, Dr. Garrett. First, thank you for all your work. Well, thank you very much event. I appreciate that. Um, I really do. So AA says love apples, but they give me gas. They do give me gas, normal or suboptimal digestion. And hope brought up hope is very helpful. For those of you who want to know hope and will and Pierre are very helpful in the comments. Um, hope asked, have you tried peeling them? Okay. The Soluble fiber, the pectin in apples, is mostly in 
the flesh. Okay. The peel is mostly insoluble fiber. Okay. I talk about dysbiosis types, fermentative and putrefactive in the program. Fermentative types tend to do better with more soluble fiber relatively like more soluble fiber versus less insoluble. It doesn't mean they have to do a ton. It just means, you know, they kind of move up and down together. They, they fermentative types do better with soluble fiber than they do with insoluble fiber. Maybe that's a better way of putting it. Putrefactive types. I'm a, I'm almost a pure putrefactive type do better with in, more insoluble fiber relative to soluble fiber. You don't get to do all of just one unless you're just taking like apple pectin or oat fiber. Like oat fiber is pretty much pure insoluble fiber. Oat fiber. Not oat bran, oat fiber. Apple pectin is pretty much pure soluble fiber. Or you could say sun fiber is a pure soluble fiber. So you don't run into pure fibers unless you're dealing with isolated stuff, supplements, basically. Vegetables are nearly, are almost all insoluble fiber, a huge percent. Huge percent is insoluble, and then they have a little bit of soluble, okay? So let me give you an example. I am a putrefactive type. When I eat apples, it actually doesn't feel right to me to not eat the skin. Like if I just ate you know, homemade applesauce or I, or I peeled an apple and I ate it, it doesn't feel right to me. And I'm fairly intuitive with this stuff. And I eat the whole apple and I'm like, oh, that's so much more satisfying. I'm a putrefactive type. More insoluble fiber works better for me. Whereas other people might be like, ooh, when I eat the peel, I, I, I just, I don't want to eat the peel. I don't like the peel. I peel the apple and I feel so much better when I eat it. They're probably a fermentative type. And their body likes just the insol or sorry, the soluble fiber, the pectin. So what we found with like, as an example, with psyllium, psyllium seems to, psyllium has both in it. It's mostly soluble fiber, but it has some insoluble fiber in it. And I think putrefactive types like myself do better with psyllium than straight soluble fibers because there's that insoluble fiber in there. So insoluble fiber also feeds your gut bacteria. Soluble fiber feeds your gut bacteria. They're feeding different types of gut bacteria, better or worse. And then fermentative and putrefactive types have different needs in terms of which strains of bacteria, bifidobacterium versus lactobacillus, which one they need to help more. So that's that's the big thing. So oh, and and if if you so if you are so that's like I have big articles in the network in the program about the dysbioses. And I'm going to be reworking those very, very soon. I have, I've got the plans and I've got the motivation and we're going to be doing, we're going to be updating pretty much the entire program to my current thoughts on things. I'm, I'm excited about it. I have to do it. It's been burning at me. So anyway, when we talk about things like fiber, well, first of all, if apples just never digest well, if, you, if you're like, well, I have homemade applesauce and I say homemade applesauce because you don't want to use jarred applesauce because it's full of formaldehyde. Jarred things, jarred things that have been cooked in the jar that have a lot of pectin. The, the fact that they've been cooked in the jar and the jar had no oxygen while it was being cooked can produce some methanol and formaldehyde, okay? If you make homemade applesauce, there's no problem. If you make homemade applesauce, it's not a problem. But if somebody put it in an airtight jar and they cook it, that's where things start becoming a problem, okay? I never got along with store-bought applesauce. I tried it so many times. I thought, this will be just so good for me. I'll just make a bowl of applesauce. I'll just get it out and dish it up. Never felt good. Ripe, overly ripe bananas. Never felt good. The formaldehyde, and I'm just sensitive to formaldehyde. I notice it and I go, 
this makes my stomach upset. I'm not going to eat this. But also in the applesauce, there wasn't insoluble fiber for me. What I talk about the gut biome. So when you start introducing soluble fiber or other fiber rich foods that these are going to affect your gut biome. They're going to, they're food for bacteria. Soluble fiber is insoluble fiber is. If you feel some sort of benefit, I talk about some probiotics too. If you feel some sort of benefit from it, but you also feel like, let's say you get kind of gassy. What you need to do is over the next two weeks, watch and see if the gassiness is going away and the benefits are staying or getting better. Then it's adjusting your gut biome in a positive way. This is the only thing, the only time when I say, maybe you feel a little bad start, whether that's like fiber or probiotics. Maybe you feel a little bad start, but if it's okay enough that you can continue, continue for a week, maybe continue for two weeks and see if the negatives go down and the positives either stay or go up. Things that affect the gut biome is what I'm talking about, especially fiber and probiotics. But if you really feel terrible on a fiber or a probiotic, don't you don't have to stay on it a week. Give it two days. Give it three days. And start slow. <laughs> it's called dose dependence. The more you do of something, the more effect you're going to get from it. So if you want to try something new and you want the smallest effect, whether that's for better, do less. Okay. But that's, that's a good, that's a good thing. Like, like apple peels feel amazing to me and pectin is kind of like, you know, the, the flesh, I mean, the flesh is why you eat the apples. Right. But I feel like if I don't get the skin with it, it just doesn't feel like, why would I eat it? So that that's one way you can, you can do that. Um, let's see. Yeah, Nate posted about colostrum contains a lot of vitamin A. That's why we do it. Um, there was a tip here for those of you who were here earlier. Uh, people watching, try exiting out completely and then come back. That is what fixed it for me. So if you, if I'm ever, if you ever, this is what was happening at the start, I guess I was, the sound was breaking up. If you have problems again, next time, just X out, just close the tab, close the YouTube window and then just reopen it. And that may, that may fix it. Okay. So. Um, Blaya says, good evening. Well, it's good morning here still. Um, we're almost to noon. I got like 12 minutes left. Um, Nate made a statement here. Purple potatoes are the safest. It's a non carotenoid pigment. That's true. That completely denatures when cooked. I don't, I didn't know that if that's true, that's, that's great. Um, white potatoes contain some lutein, which doesn't denature when cooked. So Lutein's a sneaky little, little one. Lutein can be a huge in foods and it's not that colorful. Just remember sweet potatoes are generally going to have too much vitamin A, whatever color they are. If you were going to do sweet potatoes, purple ones, and then white potatoes, peel the heck out of them. Don't eat them if they're really sprouted. Like the little, the little sprouts, the little teeny tiny ones, that's probably fine. Just if they're really sprouting or they're really green or they're bruised, get, if you're, if you're, if, okay, I'm going to put it this way. If you're really cheap, frugal, whatever you want to call it. And you're like, well, I'm not going to waste good food. I'm not going to waste these potatoes, even if they're green or bruised or sprouting too much. You better peel the hell out of those potatoes. You might peel the whole thing. Absolutely no green. Not like I see a little tinge of it here. That's probably okay. No, you peel the hell out of it. You want that potato to look the same color all over it. That same, like if you have a white potato, that same kind of cream color, like where there's no other squiggles of color in it, any of that stuff. Peel the hell out of potatoes. And then know that potatoes are the sneakiest of the nightshades. They're the ones that people can eat. And at the start, they go, I feel fine. Dr. Smith, I feel fine. I'm just, I, I do, I do potatoes. Do them like every day, once a day. And then two months later, they're like, why is my asthma acting up again? Why am I so stiff? 
why do I not feel good? And I go, you still eating those potatoes? And they go, yeah. And I say, do you remember how I told you that potatoes were the sneakiest nightshade? They just slowly creep up on you. Yeah. I'm like, that's what happened. If you're going to be dumb, you better be tough. If you don't want to believe me, just wait. Okay. Um, Christopher asked, does charcoal absorb into the bloodstream? As far as we know, it does not. Uh, Christopher commented here, coconut is also high in salicylic acid, which many people have a problem with. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Pierre says, pro tip, don't drink water. So, right, they, that's that's a good joke. I mean, that's a good joke, Pierre, about like aspirating charcoal. Well, don't aspirate water either. That That's not good. Don't aspirate cigarette smoke. I mean, right. There's people out there who are desperately trying to convince people that cigarettes are the way to health. And apparently some of them have found Grant Jenner's forum. And like smoking tobacco is the way to be healthy because it does all this stuff. What it does, it shuts down bile. And in some of the studies, they notice, oh, some of these symptoms got better. Oh, let's smoke. Let's inhale burning leaves. Smoke of any type has never been shown to be good for people. But these people go around the internet and they find places where people will let them talk. Doesn't mean they're right. Um, so Christopher says, I'm pretty sure I'm one of those people that charcoal promotes more bile flow. Yeah. So if you are, if that's true, you're lucky. <laughs> that means you can take more charcoal, but that also means you need to be careful because too much charcoal could dump more bile than the charcoal can soak up. Where does that extra bile go? It leaks into your system and then you get symptoms. So yeah, some people, some people like really don't feel good on charcoal. And probably because it, they're the bile dumpers. But some people will say, some people it's enough where it'll help them poop. You don't know until you try. And if you're going to try, start slow. Hope saying I skip breakfast a lot. I just don't get hungry usually until around lunchtime. Like I, sometimes I don't eat breakfast. I'm not saying never skip breakfast. Like if you don't feel hungry in the morning, you don't want to eat. That's fine. I'm all for, if you're not hungry, don't eat. If you're underweight and you're not hungry, you might need to eat. But, um, I eat in the morning. I have my bananas and my, my beef stick or whatever, before I go to the gym, because I have better workouts. If I eat amazing, right? Amazing. If you eat some food before you work out, after you fasted for eight hours or 10 hours, you get a better workout. Makes sense to me. Um, and then Nate said, I skip lunch because of work, but boy, am I hungry by dinner. Yeah. So I've actually found that if I eat a decent enough breakfast, which for me might be two meals in a way, because let's say I do two bananas and a beef stick before I work out and then two bananas and some chicken thighs when I get home after I work out. And then the middle of the day, I have my charcoal drink, and then I don't eat till dinner. Am I hungry by dinner? Oh, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, that I ate three times, but one was really a snack. Like the beef stick and the two bananas is like, what, 300 calories? 350 calories? It's not. That's not a lot. Anyway, so, yeah, you can skipping lunch. If you eat a really big breakfast, it's super easy to skip lunch. Like if you eat too much at breakfast, cause breakfast is like so easy to like eat a bad breakfast. Um, if you're, if you eat too much at breakfast and you don't feel full at lunch, don't eat at lunch. Like it's, if you're not hungry, don't eat. But here's the other thing. If you tend towards underweight, and you don't feel hungry a lot, and you listen to what I just said, then you might go too far that way, the other way. Like you may lose too much weight. So you still got to temper this stuff. Okay, we're, we're toxic. We have to figure out how to respond to these things that our body is doing and telling us. I wish it was easier. They've made it hard. Um, so...
Let's see. Just Andy asked bananas, soluble or insoluble. There's not much fiber in bananas, but your, your Google is as uh, good as mine here. I'll go fiber in bananas. I'll just do one of the, I always tell people if, if you're searching on the major search engines, you can make your questions sound as like as dumb as possible because that's what other people have been asking. You have to figure other people have been asking less intelligently worded questions. So that's what's going to be found on the searches. So I'm just going to type in fiber and bananas. I could type in how much fiber is in a banana, but this should get it for me. And sometimes they don't say how much soluble fiber. One me this is San Francisco gate.com. Our bananas high in soluble fiber. One medium banana has three grams of total fiber and 0.6 grams of soluble fiber. By comparison, a medium pear has four grams of total fiber and two and a half grams of soluble fiber. So after apples, so I want you to see that three grams total for bananas, 0.6 gram of that three grams is soluble fiber. So even bananas are mostly insoluble fiber. So when you're thinking of most plant foods, <coughs> Most plant foods, fruit and vegetables are going to be mostly insoluble fiber. Except apples are number one in pectin. Pears are number two. But yeah, bananas are, are still mostly insoluble. But like I said, I do better. Maybe that's why, again, bananas and me get along. Because I'm a putrefactive type and putrefactive types do better on inside. I mean, I do better on fruits, low vitamin A fruits, mostly bananas and vegetables, the low vitamin A ones. That's mostly insoluble fiber. I'm feeding my gut biome what it needs, what it wants. And I do some soluble fiber but I focus on insoluble. So this is going to be in the rewrites of the, of the fiber stuff in the program, folks. Let's see. My thoughts on nicotine gum, it's, it's toxic as hell. I don't know what else to say about it. Go look at the ingredients. Like you want to eat titanium dioxide and all, I mean, just look at the chemical ingredients. I mean, nicotine gum is basically made by like miniature pharmaceutical companies. So I, if you were using it actively as a tool, if you if you actually went into quitting cigarettes with nicotine gum as an active tool that you were using, that you had a plan to go down, most people just sub out nicotine gum for cigarettes and they just chew on nicotine gum for the rest of their lives. Do I think nicotine gum is some biohack? No, I think the people who say that nicotine gum is some sort of biohack, I think their biohacking has ruined their brain already. It may feel good short term, but who in the hell looks at cigarette smokers and is like, obviously, they've been biohacking for 30 years with their cigarettes. That's why they look so good and sound so good. No, they sound terrible and they look terrible. So nicotine gum is for the for the trash can. But if you were quitting something. Could be useful. All depends on how it's used. Um. Dobromir asks for my thoughts on quinoa. I'm, it is something that people have been using in the program instead of rice because rice has an arsenic problem. If you don't know about the problem of rice with arsenic, you should get educated on it because all the brands, I don't care what the companies say, all of them have arsenic in them. Some of the places you can get rice from seems to have less. Like, um, what was it? Indian Rice from India, see, organic rice from India seems to have the least. Does it still have some? It's like fish and shellfish. Here's the two things if you take away from today, you, you need to know. All rice contains a significant amount of arsenic. It's just whether it's better or worse in terms of where it is on the list. Same thing with fish and shellfish. I don't care where you're getting the fish and shellfish from. It all contains mercury and probably forever chemicals and pharmaceuticals and all sorts of the nasty stuff that we put in the ocean. All tea plant, green tea, black tea, white tea, oolong tea, whatever, 
It's all got fluoride in it. Okay, some of these things pull stuff out of the soil. That's what they do. They're very good at pulling that out and concentrating it. Is that a defense mechanism? I don't know. But quinoa is all right. I would still, I mean, some people are still soaking it. Some people are even soaking it with charcoal. So they soak it overnight with like, you know, a half teaspoon or a teaspoon of charcoal in it. Because if there's toxic things, toxic water soluble things that are in that grain that are going to come out in the water, like with rice, the arsenic comes out in the water when you soak it. The problem is when, when here's the problem with rice, when you cook rice in just the right amount of water. So when you're done cooking it, it's dry. When you had the water in there, the arsenic moved into the water. When you cooked away the steam, the water into steam, the water disappeared and it left the arsenic. And then you just, then you just coat the outside of the rice with the water that's left. That's full of arsenic. So none of the arsenic left. It was up. It was in the water. You steamed off all the water cooking the rice. And now the water is gone and you have rice with an arsenic coating. That's how it works. So everything, all the processes to get arsenic out of rice are all soaking of some, whether you're cooking it while you're soaking it or whether you're soaking it before, it's all an excess of water or whether you're cooking rice in an excess of water to dump off kind of like cooking pasta. But the other thing you can do, if you look in the research, arsenic has been removed from wastewater with activated carbon, AKA charcoal. You could soak your rice with some charcoal and it will soak up the arsenic better than anything else. So then could we use that with other grains in theory for other potential toxic things that might be in the grains? Sure, you could use it for quinoa. You could use it for any other grain. Just soak it overnight. I, I soak it in, if, if I was going to do it. I, I don't eat many grains because I told you, I don't. it doesn't agree with me that much. I, 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 some people are like, why don't you eat the grains and the beans? I'm like, because it doesn't agree with me that much. I've had people come on the program and tell me the very best thing I ever recommended to them was to eat beans. I don't get along with them that great, but they get, they're like, this is the greatest thing anybody ever told me to do. And I go, that's perfect. That's what we're after. Why is everybody else out there going, there's one human diet, one human diet. That's it. I'm like, no, nope. So actually, so somebody was, uh, Hope mentioned, I would cook quinoa like you would pasta as it has a lot of saponin. So let's just go see saponin. Activated carbon PubMed. Let's just see if it. Let's see if there's anything on activated charcoal soaking up saponins. Well, here's a paper called Saponins as Cytotoxic Agents A Review. Cytotoxic would mean toxic to cells. Oh, uh, here's an interesting one. Here, let me put this link in there. <laughs> so remember, remember they, they studied retinoic acid for use as an adjuvant in um, immune shots. Well, here's a paper called Exploring the Possible Use of Saponin Adjuvants in COVID-19 Vaccine. That's interesting. Nothing much with Okay, I don't know what this means. The energy of sorption of saponin by activated carbon is negative. Evidence of the gain in the energy with interactions proceeding in the solution of the sorptive sorbent system. I have no idea what that means. Oh, oh, here we go. Here we go. Act adsorption treatment of saponin wastewater by activated carbon and regeneration of used activated carbon. There we go. Well, active, so if you had issues with saponins in the quinoa, or if you didn't want to have issues with saponins in quinoa, soaking them overnight with, you know, half teaspoon, teaspoon of charcoal could be a good approach. So that's all I have today, folks. Hope you all enjoyed it. Hope glad to have you here at the new time. Um, sorry, we moved from Friday. This is the normal time now. So hope you all have a great start to your week. Remember, like, subscribe, 
comment below, tell your friends, and we'll see you all next time. Bye now.